Hey everyone and welcome back to my lecture series on PDEs. Today we're going to go further in our introduction to PDEs by discussing the types of solutions we get as well as the auxiliary conditions we need to specify in a PDE problem. Let's start by looking at one of the simplest second order PDEs, which is a parabolic PDE. I invite you to verify that this is indeed parabolic using the material we learned in the last lecture. If you're solving a problem and the only thing you're given is this PDE, then, well, get wrecked. There are so many solutions to this that you could throw in a wide class of functions into your final answer, and you would be right. For example, you can show that half x squared plus t is a solution to this PDE. Don't believe me? Well, start by partially differentiating this with respect to x. Since t is held constant during this partial differentiation, the t goes away and the first partial derivative of u with respect to x is just x. The 2 comes down and then reduces by 1. Hopefully you know this by now. If you partially differentiate this again because the PDE has the second derivative in x, you'll get the second derivative of u with respect to x is just 1. Now for the partial derivative with respect to t, that's pretty simple. It's just 1. Now check. Does the second derivative of u with respect to x equal its first derivative with respect to t? And it does, because 1 equals 1 is just true. It's an identity. Let's look at u equals e to the power x times e to the power t. Differentiating this with respect to x twice gives us the same thing, because the derivative of the exponential is just the exponential. Differentiating with respect to t now gives us e to the x times e to the t once again and applying the check that du dt equals the second derivative of u with respect to x, we pass that. So even this exponential solution satisfies our PDE. Now it might seem weird, and it is a bit weird, that solutions that look so different, one is a polynomial and the other is an exponential, both of them satisfy the same PDE. Hell, even something like this complementary error function satisfies this PDE. With simple ODEs, you wouldn't encounter this problem. Typically, you could write a general solution in terms of arbitrary unknown constants. But with PDEs, you can't do that. With PDEs, it's absolutely essential to know the auxiliary conditions, by which I mean the boundary and initial conditions. Because these things aren't just important when it comes to specifying a unique solution, but in many cases, the nature of the boundary and initial conditions dictates how you're going to solve the PDE. So if you don't have boundary and initial conditions, you won't even know what technique to use when solving this problem. Let's first discuss initial conditions. Usually in PDE problems, the independent variables, which are the ones you differentiate with respect to, are either spatial coordinates like x, y, and z, or something time-related like t. In an initial condition, you specify the property of the function you're solving for at some time t. For instance, you could specify the spatial state of the solution at time t0, and you could specify the time derivative of the solution at time t0. If necessary, you could also specify higher order time derivatives, all at the same value t0. With initial conditions, the number of initial conditions you need is typically the same as the highest order of the time derivative in your PDE. What do I mean by this? Take the parabolic PDE example above. You only need one initial condition, since you only take the first time derivative of u here. The initial condition you need here is the value or shape of the solution u at time t0. However, if I had a PDE that had time derivatives up to the third order, I would need three initial conditions, the value of u at t0 and the values of its first and second derivatives at t0. In general, if I had the nth time derivative in my PDE, then I would need initial conditions up to the n minus 1 time derivative. The other kind of auxiliary condition is a boundary condition. Boundary conditions, unlike initial conditions, specify properties of the solution at particular spatial positions, typically on the edges of the spatial domain where the PDE applies. There are three main types of boundary conditions, at least the most important ones. The first type is the Dirichlet boundary condition, also called the Dirichlet boundary condition. I tend to go with the French pronunciation. Anyway, this just means that the value of the solution itself is specified at a certain point or boundary edge. So if my solution u is only a function of x and t, 
a Dirichlet boundary condition at x equals zero would specify the value of u at that boundary as a function of time. On the other hand, if u was a function of x, y, and t, then a Dirichlet boundary condition at x equals zero would be specified generally as a function of y and t. The second type of boundary condition is a Neumann boundary condition, in which the derivative of the solution is specified at the boundary instead of the function itself. Again, if u was a function of two spatial variables and one time variable, then the Neumann boundary condition at, say, x equals zero would specify what the derivative of u in x would look like as a function of y and t, similar to what we had up here for the Dirichlet boundary condition, except now it's the derivative. The same would apply to the third type of boundary condition, called the Robin boundary condition, in which a linear combination of the derivative of the solution at the boundary and the value of the function at the boundary is specified. So a Robin boundary condition is very much like a Dirichlet boundary condition and a Neumann boundary condition put together. The number of boundary conditions we need for a particular PDE is usually the sum of the orders of the highest derivatives in each spatial variable. What do I mean by that? As an example, if my PDE is the same parabolic PDE mentioned earlier, then in this case to solve it I would have to integrate twice in x basically. In doing so I would introduce two arbitrary integration constants, which means that I would need two boundary conditions to specify those constants. Now I'm not explicitly integrating when I'm solving it, but when trying to visualize how many boundary conditions you'll need, it's good to think of it in terms of integration. On the other hand, if my PDE was the time derivative of u with respect to t equals di 2u di x squared plus di 2u di y squared, then I would need four boundary conditions, two for x to make up for the two derivatives in x, and then two for y to make up for the two derivatives in y. If my PDE was something even crazier, like di u di t equals di 6u by di x6 plus the eighth derivative of u with respect to y, then I would need 14 boundary conditions, 6 for x and 8 for y. Now there are instances when you don't need boundary conditions because the domain in which your PDE applies isn't finite. If you encounter something like this, then it's probably best not to start panicking because there are other auxiliary conditions you might be able to specify to get a valid and unique solution. For instance, if you're solving for the wave function in Schrodinger's equation, then you have a normalization condition that needs to be satisfied for the wave function to be physically valid. There are also other kinds of auxiliary conditions that come up when the domain isn't bounded, meaning it's not finite, it's infinite. These conditions typically arise from the physics of the problem, so they're treated on a case-by-case -case basis. Anyway, that does it for this video. In the next video, we're going to go start with parabolic PDEs.